one. All right, everybody, let's do this. For the first time ever in the Productive Conversations podcast, we are covering the UFC Ultimate Fighting Championship. We are expanding our horizons, and we're going to have a lot of fun with them. Our first UFC event, we are covering UFC 288, coming out of the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey. We have a bantamweight championship. We got fighters going off, fighting for legacies, and it's simple. It's about to go down. So introducing the first member of the productive MMA crew, he is one of the producers of this podcast, Alexander DeJesus, a.k.a. Dolo Ren. Let us start our UFC coverage. What is up, Dolo? Great to see you. My guy, Matt Brown. How you doing, bro? How's everything? I'm fantastic, you know. Just tired, but a, but a blessing. A real blessing. Despite being tired, we're still grinding. You know, you are my main man in this. We are growing this brand. And um, this is actually a really good day for the show to try something different. And... uh Adding to our repertoire, you know, we've obviously hit the MLB, the NFL, the NBA. Oh, yeah, you know. We've it. hit golf, the Oscars. We've covered major world events. We've had drag queens and comedians and entrepreneurs and OnlyFan models and so much you more. And now we're adding UFC to our brand. And this is exciting to have you be a part of it and really leading this way, man. That's how I'm feeling. How are you feeling? Ooh. Hey, all right. Cool, cool. You're bringing the fire. That's what's up. Hey, man, we were just, well, a few things, a few things off rip. Glad to be back. You know, I, yes. I, 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 I've really been camera shy for a long time. You know, there's been, you know, a few moving pieces, moving parts of my life. So, you know, I haven't been on camera as much, but, you know, it's good. You know, always good to be back, man. You know, it's always good to, you know, chop it up with you. Uh, of course, you my we guy. Just, oh, absolutely, man. We were just chopping it up too about about you know the reels and the views and stuff. You mm -hmm. know, we've just you know in less than a year, man. We we've been we've been doing some damage, man, in a good way. In a good way, man. It's yeah, around five hundred thousand views since we started. Um, since you came on in August, across all our platforms, and only growing from there. This is really exciting, man. And uh, look what we're look what we're accomplishing, and this is only the beginning, you know. Man, it's you know you you know, I I, I kind of set you up. I don't know how you want to put it, but either you set me up for the alley oop, or I set you up for the alley oop. Either way, we're hey, scoring man, we, points. We both at it, man. One day I do the alley oop, one day you do, one day you're D Wade in that picture, one day I'm LeBron, and vice versa. And <laughs> That's it's a only, fact. <laughs> and it's only going up from here. So why don't we move to a new chapter with the show? And as I said, for the first time ever, we are covering the UFC. Obviously, the UFC is as big as ever, and it's only growing bigger. And now it's time to add this part of our combat sport. Web I'm sure we have the wrestling sports entertainment, but now we're getting into some real fights. Mixed martial arts, and obviously the number one mixed martial arts company in the world, UFC. And it's our time to now cover it. So as I mentioned, this Saturday, May 6th, 2023, the UFC is holding their next event. UFC 288, Sterling versus Cejudo is your headline. Coming out of the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey. And as I said, the uh, big main event, which we'll get into shortly, Al Jermaine Sterling, he is the champ. He is the reigning Bateman. Yeah, it's Ban. Sorry, Bannerman. It's okay. Let me restart this to help you with the real, too. Go ahead. So we have... The Bantam Weight, one more time. We have the Bantam Weight Championship, Aljamain Sterling versus Henry Cejudo. And we have some other matches in between there. But before there we go, get, man. we start off with the main event and we give your predictions. Talk to me about UFC 2D88. So, as I mentioned in the audio portion, and I'll mention now, I love the UFC from afar, huge admirer of the sport. I haven't followed it too much. But I'm always it's it's hard to not know when a big UFC event's happening, and now this is a chance to really expand on it and and uh, learn more about it, and that's what you are here for as we hopefully grow this team as well. But here, one thing I want to add right there, um, as you say that, when it comes to like you know mixed martial arts, even boxing, you know sports like that, 
um you'll find some diehard fans you'll find some fans that you know that will know every little thing about the sport you know every undercard fighter you know fighters in you know kind of minor league mma companies when it comes to you know being new to the sport you don't even got to worry about it bro a lot of, most mma fans are very welcoming to you know new people joining the sport you know you know we 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 love to you know talk about fights all the time you know when we're not talking about them we're watching them and it's 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 my pleasure it's my pleasure to you know get this started with you mm -hmm. and hopefully it becomes a thing and you know we get to some you know deep analysis as as one would call it there is no doubt about it dull and we're gonna have a lot of fun so the way we'll we'll go through the big fights of the main card talk about some other mma news and what's going on and before like i said before we first get into our main event talk to me about ufc right now what's going on what are the big what, what where is this company going obviously we had the last big event was huge so a lot of celebrities in the building. Again, I don't remember what happened. This is where mm -hmm. you come in, but I know it was a big deal. Um, the next one, which we'll cover in early June, Amanda Nunez. I know she's one of the big deals in the women's division. She has a big main event match coming up. But what else is going on with the UFC and Dana White, and what um, and where where is the UFC going? I should ask. Well, the UFC, it's well. If we're talking about the last event, I think we're talking about John Jones versus Cyril Gunn. Yeah, yeah. That was it. And um there was an event recently with um Gilbert Burns versus Jorge Masvidal, which is funny because Gilbert Burns is fighting on this card coming up as well. Um, you know, it's less than a month. I believe that was the last big main event, but the last real one that everyone was talking about was the John Jones and Cyril Gunn one. And Man, that was that was a hell of a fight. I I honestly, to to be completely honest with you, um, you know, me and Matt, we talk about you know sports betting all the time and stuff. You know, even even some of the reels are based on predictions and stuff. But uh, when it comes to MMA, I'm very confident with my bets, and you know, me and Matt have talked okay. about that before. Um, I got the John Jones and Surreal Gone fight wrong. I got mm -hmm. it wrong. I, I'll admit it on camera. I got it wrong. Uh, my thinking behind it was, well, John Jones was coming off a re off a pretty long retirement. I believe a three year retirement, same as same as Henry Cejudo. I believe it was three years. Um, some maybe three to four, but either way, about the same time as you know, as Henry Cejudo has been retired at this point, and and you know he was he was going from light heavyweight going up a weight class to heavyweight and to be honest with you john jones's transition into heavyweight has been well documented on his part you know he's put up a lot of instagram clips and a lot of reels and you know a lot of a lot of posts you know showing showing himself just lifting weights and deadlifting and putting on all this all this mass and all this muscle and we were seeing more of that less so than you know the technical striking drills that we're used to seeing from him and it was you know to me it was a bit misleading because sometimes you can go down that road as a fighter where you start putting on a lot of weight you want to put on a lot of muscle you change your routine and you you don't stick to what got you there and I, I kind of assumed that was going to happen with John Jones and Surreal Gun. Not just not just that, but also the ring rust, you know, that plays a factor. And with his with the previous outings when he fought um what was his name? You know, like Anthony Smith, uh I'm trying to think of the last person he fought too. Um, give me one second. Yeah, you know second. better than me. And, and um, you know, I'm as a casual, I'm definitely aware of John Jones and his impact. And now with his return, do you see him sticking it out for multiple Apologies. years at this point? Apologies for the for the interruption. Dominic Reyes, you know, I, I try to get these names right, you know. <laughs> and we're gonna step into this, so I, I want to get their names as perfect as possible. You know, um, of based off um I'll get back to your question in a second. But um, 
you know, just based off the previous outing with, you know, Dominic Reyes and even Anthony Smith and, you know, and, you know, those guys before, I just felt that John Jones was on a decline in general. Just, I just felt in general he was on a decline. And I thought he was going to come back on that decline when he faced Surreal Gan, who was, who admittedly had just lost to Francis Ngannou prior to the John Jones fight. Mm -hmm. it, it, it didn't turn out how I wanted. Surreal Gan is, is an elite striker, yes, regardless of what's happened. Um, he's an elite striker. He's a guy that's been proven, you know, a guy that came right into the UFC, you know, a guy that's great at kickboxing, that trained with Francis, Francis Ngannou and everything. But um, when they met, when John Jones and Gan, and Gan met, it was, I couldn't even say it was fireworks. It was just a quick showing. It was just a quick night, night, put them to sleep kind of match, you know. Um, what we found out when John Jones fought Surreal Gan was that John Jones didn't miss a step. He's he's the same fighter that he was when he was younger, you know, when he used to call him chicken legs and everything. Uh, Why do they call him chicken legs? It, it was always it, it's it's a running joke in MMA that like John Jones can never put muscle on his calves like his his legs have always been very skinny. So like, really? they always, like yeah, it's, it's been a running joke in MMA, along with like, you know, the cocaine jokes and like oh, boy. the the PED jokes and stuff. But um. Mm -hmm. But yeah, John Jones came out, you know, after a three-year layoff, after dealing with some of the biggest criticism in the game, you know, with the whole domestic violence case with his wife. It, it was nasty. It was nasty. And that happened on the same day he was indicted into the Hall of Fame for UFC. You mean inducted? Inducted, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, indicted. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, got my mind messed up. Either way. um, He could have been indicted, but either way, that's another story. Um. He he was going through all of this stuff, you know, with previous outings not going as good as he wanted, but still squeaking by with the wins. Uh, he came back and it, it's like none of that ever happened. Within, I think, two and a half minutes of the first round, Surreal Gan tried to throw some jabs, you know, tried to throw, you know, some crosses. He, he threw a cross, I believe, and then John Jones was able to just slip it, go around it, catch him. You know, catch him, bring him to the ground, drag him across the cage. And I think he put him in a rear naked choke. I believe yeah. it was a rear naked choke. And then Surreal Gan is, he, he went to sleep for at least like 20 seconds and woke up like he didn't know where he was. Insane, you know? man. What these, what these athletes go through, they really take a beating for our entertainment. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I know I got on a tangent with John Jones. It was just incredible to see something like that. You know, that's that's kind of like that's kind of like how Michael Jordan came back, you know, <laughs> won a champ, I'm back. left for a few years, then came back and won a, an, another three. You know, yeah. that's that's legendary in sports. That's that's that, that's one of those accomplishments accomplishments that you can't really match. It's that's an overall sports accomplishment. So John Jones proved he's probably the greatest fighter that ever lived. Uh, maybe not ever lived because who knows there could have been giants and you know Genghis Khan is probably a crazy fighter too but we're mm -hmm. talking about in the modern day UFC MMA John Jones is undoubtedly undisputedly the best fighter that ever lived in the modern day really so he is the Muhammad Ali of this whole sp this whole promotion I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, Ali was Ali had his faults, but John Jones kind of. Ah, ah, I like the comparison, Matt, but it's it's it's. it's well, that's it's what you're here for to lead one. me. But that's a okay, controversial we'll, one. We'll say John Jones is top ten greatest UFC fighters ever, to, no matter the weight class. That's a fact. Uh, well, also other things that happened. Jorge Masvidal retired. Um, like I mentioned before, Gilbert Burns and Masvidal fought recently, like in the past month or so, and. And you know, Masvidal was dealing with some, with some, I guess, uh, with a criminal investigation. He he's facing charges, you know, battling it in court against Colby Covington, a guy that mm. he's had beef with for a long time. That's also one of those nightmare matchups for anybody in welterweight. Um, 
yeah, Masvidal was dealing with a lot of stuff out of the ring, out of the octagon, and losing his last um, match to Colby Covington, which is ironic enough that, you know, he was probably going to lose another match in court against Colby Covington. Uh, he fights Gilbert Burns. You know, Gilbert Burns is is not too old, but he's like 35 years old. And MMA is, you know, more and more, more and more so you see guys start to fight up into their 40s, 42s and stuff. And even in other companies, you know, you got guys, you got MMA guys boxing at like 50 years old. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> still getting a check, so you can't be too mad at it. Uh, yeah, man, might as well if you could do it. And I guess the last John Jones question before we get into this event. Um, you mentioned here in these notes that he might be, his next fight might be coming up soon. Can you talk to us about John Jones's next fight and what's being speculated or what's being seen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So pretty much uh John Jones has recently came out. Uh he recently came out and said that if if he fights Steve Amiochik, he's more than likely gonna and well if he wins, if he beats Steve Amiochik, which is another guy in heavyweight that's that um I believe currently has no no no. He lost the belt to Francis Ngannou. Then Nganu retired, and then the John Jones, bless you, and the John Jones surreal gone fight was for the vacant title. So John Jones has the belt now. Um, whereas Steve Miocic had it like a year or two ago, um, and Steve Miocic is still one of those guys in heavyweight that could that could get the belt on any given day, but now that John Jones has the strap, it's to be honest, I, I don't see I don't see um Steve Amiochik winning that fight if that ever happens, but we'll get into that. Um either way, if he beats Stipe, he says he wants to retire. Okay, so, John Jones, but Yeah, John do Jones. Do you think he should? Does he have anything else to prove? Or just no. so no, maybe that... one more match, retire on top with the belt and Go off in the sunset. You'd like to I mean, see that. arguably, arguably, you could say he proved everything when he beat DC because Daniel Cormier, aka DC, uh, he was a guy that had the belt, had a heavyweight belt also. In the past few years, I know it sounds kind of confusing, but in the past few years, the heavyweight belt has went from DC to Stipe to Nganu, now to John Jones. It's kind of wild, but um, but uh. You know, Daniel Cormier was a heavyweight champion as well. And John Jones beat him twice. So, you know, in a lot of ways, a lot of people would say that he had nothing to prove already. This is more like adding, what does LeBron say? He's like adding toppings to the cake or whatever. <laughs> yeah, something yeah. like that. He's he's in LeBron status, you know. and But he's technically undefeated. He John Jones has one loss in his record, but it's like a... It's like a fluke loss. He he lost because he did an illegal move. He was beating a guy up, but did one illegal move and he got disqualified. So it's 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 there. The one is there on his loss column, but it's like invisible. It's like a the biggest asterisk you could put next to a loss. Um, Interesting. All right. But in that same vein, he also has big asterisks next to his wins against DC because he he popped for some type of PED. Um, when he when he fought DC the first time, and I believe the second time, no, the second time he did, first time he popped for cocaine. Um, John Jones has a lot of things in his history that, you know, certain people will say, oh, how can he be a, a pound for pound number one if he took steroids? You shouldn't even be on the list if you've done performance enhancers. Right. It's 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 muddy waters because it's not it's not a straightforward thing. Yes, he did do PEDs, but. Whether knowingly or not knowingly, it was found in his system at a very microscopic, tiniest level that you could possibly find a particle in. The way that the USADA um, president put it on the Joe Rogan show, he said, "Uh, he said it's like finding it's like finding a raindrop in a swimming pool." So it's well, like that's the amount of PDs they found in John Jones' system. Now the really? caveat to that is that. Chael Sonnen, what you know, another fighter, another legendary UFC fighter, has explained how steroid cycles go. 
and mind you, I'm not trying to discredit John Jones for anything. Um, just kind of going into more depth into what we're talking about. And all credit to John Jones, all credit to everyone that goes into a ring. Either way, uh, time for the truth. So Chael Sonnen, he 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 was explaining how steroid cycles go. It's like you you do steroids, right? You do them for like whether whatever steroid or PED it is. You do it for you do it in cycles. So you'll do it for like two weeks and then not do it for a few weeks and then do it for another week and then don't do it for a few months and then do it for another few days. And it's like you do it, you do it while you train to get the best enhancement from it, and then you weed it out your system. What some people are now, the reason for me saying this is that some people are alluding to the fact that, oh, just because you found a teardrop, a raindrop of of PED usage in his in his blood system, that doesn't mean it's like an accident or something minuscule. That was just the end of the steroid cycle. Really? Yeah, well, so you John know, Jones has a very marred kind of history and a very marred image, but at the end of the day, what you do in the ring is what is what's what people are going to look at, what fans are going to look at, and in that vein, he's still the greatest as far as fighting, but his his legacy is something else. Yeah, the whole debate on P on PEDs has been, you know, no matter if it's baseball, football, you know, this powerlifting, wrestling. I understand performance enhancing semantics wise. Mm. It says it all right there, but you know, you can make the argument, are they, does it really make your skill better? And I guess it's a case by case basis, but all in all, it's it's funny that you brought that up. Not to interrupt you, Matt, I'm sorry, but, um, right there, John Jones, he said that. He, he tweeted when DC was going off on a tangent on Twitter saying, oh, John Jones cheated. He's, he used steroids to beat me, yada, yada. Oop-de-oop. John Jones replied to him with the highlight of him head kicking him and in in getting a high kick to the head. He was like, yo, was that steroids? Was my high kick, was, you know, was this set up to the head kick <laughs> steroids or was that my skill? So what you just there said you right there, Matt, is the same thing John Jones is saying in his own defense. So... Right, you know, it's, it's it's a slippery slope. It, you could go is. all day about steroids, but all in all, you know, obviously the cleaner the better, but just uh, make better choices, right? Yeah, you'd rather not be caught with anything. They they called it a picogram. That's the that's the scientific term of what they caught in the system. A picogram of PEDs. You don't want to be caught with a picogram, not a nanogram, not nothing. You don't want to be caught with that in your system at all. Mm-hmm. But if you do, it definitely helps you if you have the president of USADA defending you yeah, in a right. Joe Rogan episode, you know, so it, these things matter, you know, all these things, you know, it's up to the people to really decide at the end of the day. But um, mm-hmm. there's other stories, too, that we could get into. But, you know, we could make this whole John Jones episode, to be honest. But, you know, but yeah, there's other things. But yeah, man, it's people you know. getting making sure they're talking about him and props to him there. So why don't we now go switch gears and talk about the actual event now, UFC 288, Newark, New Jersey, and let's talk about the main event. We have the Bantamweight Championship on the line at UFC 288. Aljamain Sterling is your champion. He is going up against Henry Cejudo. And the first question here, and the big thing to find out, Alex. Yes, sir. And Al Jermaine beat that ass and retained his championship. <laughs> All right. So what I want to mention about this card off rip, the UFC 288. Well, I actually didn't know it was in Newark, New Jersey. That's actually pretty cool. Um, you think you would have co- you would have planned to go if you knew earlier? It's not too far. I mean, that's the thing. I'll know about the fights and I'll be up to date on what's going on in the sport. But the actual events, I never look at the location. Sometimes they make it apparent, but I feel like they didn't mm-hmm. really make it apparent as as apparent this time. So I don't know. It, that's definitely my fault for not knowing. I would have loved to have gone, <laughs> but um, but it's cool, man. It's cool. Like uh, I I'll eventually I'll, I'll catch an event one day. I went to a Bellator event one time at the um Grand Rock Casino. That's what it's called. Where it's like a casino around here? In in Connecticut, Mohegan. Yeah, yeah, Mohegan. Oh, why did I say Grand Rock? No. <laughs> uh, Mohegan. Yeah, 
Mohegan Sun, I caught a Bellator fight there, and it was pretty cool. But um, How about one that? day we will catch a UFC fight. We will, we will. This would have been a great opportunity, but we don't cry over spilled milk. Hmm. Either way, uh, it's it's a botch card, cause um, well, Sahudo and Sterling were always gonna fight. They were always gonna fight on his card, and it was gonna be the main the main billing, the main main event. Um, but as far as the co-main event. That was the one that I personally was very excited for. Even though we got we got a good fight here now with, with um with Bilal, but um with Bilal and um Bilal Muhammad and uh Gilbert Burns. But uh the Charles Oliveira, he's a guy from Brazil, a very, very fun, exciting fighter to see. A very skilled practitioner of jiu-jitsu, has was trained with the best guys in Brazil. Um very good striker, very good striker, and just a tough, tough guy. Like, you could drop him three, four times, and he'll end up with the knockout, and he's a fan favorite because of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that would have been – he. that's a fight that you want to see. That she, that's a fighter you want to watch. If you're bringing a friend, say, I'm bringing you to a fight, that would have been an, a great fight for you to see, someone that has balls, someone that has skills, and that's, you know, ready to bleed and ready to put on a show – you know, I know this sounds kind of wild, but that's just, that's the nature of the sport. We like Either it. Way. We like it. It sucks that they're not fighting because I believe Oliveira had a injury, and Benil Dariush is a is a popular guy in his own right. You know, um, he yeah. It says here Charles Oliveira withdrew for an undisclosed injury, but it is rescheduled for the next UFC two eighty nine in June. Yeah, I did hear about the um, rescheduling. You know, I, I, it's it's cool that they're still fighting because that's a really good fight too. Benio Dariush, he's a really strong fighter. He, he's actually very similar to Bilal Muhammad in the way he fights. You know, mm -hmm. um, I call it caveman striking when you're kind of like squared up and you kind of like just throwing punches coming forward. But mm -hmm. they're very like it's, a real it's art fight. to it. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. But it's a, it's an art to it when you do it in spurts. And, you know, these guys are still smart fighters. You know, sometimes they look kind of crazy when they swing. But, you know, these are aggressive fighters. They, they have similar styles. You know, the the guy that substituted Bino Dariush has a similar style. And um, and Gilbert Burns, the guy that's uh replacing Charles Oliveira for their, you know, for this welterweight title. I'm um, not title fight, but welterweight belt. Um, he's from Brazil. So there's... It's kind of can't. It's kind of uncanny, uncanny. Some of the similarities, um, that these two fights have, but either way, um, yeah. Focusing on this bout though, the bantamweight yeah. title. What, where do you see this direction going? Yeah, that's yeah. I'm sorry. So yeah, that's that's part of the reason why that card was botched because we we lost that fight. But back to the main event, um, with Cejudo and Sterling. Now Cejudo's coming off. A uh, three-year retirement. Um, this is a guy that um, just to give you a background on who Henry Cejudo is, and I'll get to the champion first. I mean, the champion second, but um, Henry Cejudo. He is a guy that has a gold medal in wrestling. Um, has had about, from his own admission recently, has had about, I don't know about, but like over a thousand wrestling matches in his in his whole life. Not MMA matches, wrestling. Yeah, a true thousand. amateur wrestling. Yeah, a, a crazy amount of a crazy amount of wrestling um experience. So he's and very bold. technical, I would I would guess. Oh yeah, it's you know he he developed more of his skills you know throughout his MMA career. He's not a guy that's like undefeated like Mayweather, but he is a guy that um has a gold medal in wrestling. You know, just a gold medal in in combat sports is undeniably you know a great merit to have you know yeah. not very many fighters at all in general in any combat sport have gold medals so boom you got that because even ronda rousey she had a bronze medal she had a bronze medal in judo so you know it's still a medal it's you know it's still an amazing accomplishment but you know gold medal is something else either way Cejudo, he has a gold medal in wrestling he's um he he saved he saved, I, I believe it was the the featherweight division in M in in men's MMA for the UFC. He saved that division, um, because he was he was a champion in that division after beating Demetrius Johnson, someone that's con 
that's very high on people's pound for pound list. Uh, he saved the division because Dana White was getting was about to get rid of the division because nobody was watching. You straight know? up get rid of it. Oh yeah, Dana White is like that. He's he's like that, bro. He's really like that. He was really gonna um get rid of the whole division, but then, you know, he fought. Then a guy from a bantamweight came down and fought Henry Cejudo. You know, thinking that this guy T.J. Dillashaw, the one we're talking about, uh, he was a champion at bantamweight. He comes down. He tries. You know, he tries to take Henry Cejudo's belt. Cejudo knocks him out in like the first round immediately. Now Cejudo has two belts. So pretty much, you know, uh, yeah, it was, it, you know, from there on, he started calling himself uh, Triple C. Uh, like two champions and a gold medal, like he's a triple champion. So he, he started going around calling himself Triple C. Uh, but people started calling him Triple Cringe because like he, he makes like really cringy like jokes. And like he's he's like. He's one of those guys that is just like, uh, like it's like, uh, you like, kind of embarrassing, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, but uh, all that aside, he's an amazing fighter. He's he's like I said, he's beating a pound for pound great fighter in Demetrius Johnson. Uh, he's been on a win streak. He defended um, he defended his title against against uh, Dominic Cruz before he retired in twenty twenty. And he's he's trained with some of the best guys. He's even with John Jones return. Uh, I don't know if some people know, but Henry Cejudo actually showed what John Jones was supposed to do to beat Surreal Gan before they fought. And John really? Jones went it. Yeah, like he he has a YouTube channel. He posts videos and stuff, and really great great trainer. He's went. Henry Cejudo has proven over the time, even though he's a really cringy dude, he's he has an amazing combat mind. So, um, so yeah, he was helping John Jones. He was in John Jones' camp, you know, helping John Jones for his fight, his return. We all see, we all see how that went. And literally, Henry Cejudo is, showed him exactly what to do, and John Jones executed it exactly how it was. And yeah, man, you know, Cejudo's trained with Zhang Weili. Uh, um, another champion, another champion, women's champion. She's a strawweight champion. So he's trained with so many champions, you know, so many great people. And now it's funny because now him and Demetrius Johnson have like a Rocky and a Apollo Creed kind of relationship where they've beaten each other and now they train with each other. That's so it's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's something that, you know, they respect each other. So, you know, Cejudo is a great fighter. He's coming off a of three-year retirement. Now, let's talk about Aljamain. Aljamain Sterling. Um, his nickname is the Funk Master. Um, he He's a very skilled fighter in his own right. What makes him so uh, funky? Uh, honestly, man, his his style is really weird. He, he is an awkward guy. I'm not really sure why they call him Funk Master. But he has a very weird style. He like uh, not a very weird weird style, but like uh, he has very weird kind of striking. You know, like uh, but it's effective. He gets in there, you know, and he he creates angles. It's it's decent boxing, you could say. You know, he, um, either way, that's not even his strength. He's a wrestler too. He's a collegiate wrestler, um, very collegiate wrestler, uh, and has he's twenty two and three. He's on an eight fight win streak. That's something that should be known. He's on an eight fight win streak. Um, this is another guy that you know they call him cringy too because like he makes kind of cringy jokes. They're both cringy dudes. It's it's really funny because Aljamain and Henry Cejudo are both cringy dudes, but they're both both very 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 well respected. You know, I shouldn't say well respected. Very very good at, at their craft, and you know part of the elite class of of the UFC and um pretty much Aljamain Sterling he he's the first ever in any weight class in any weight class to to win a championship by disqualification now how that went is he fought a guy named Peter Yan another guy that's at you know the same the same weight class bantamweight that we're talking about 
the one that, you know, Henry Cejudo retired from, had the belt. And then Aljamain Sterling, you know, um, he fought Peter Yan, who who ended up getting the belt. And, and Peter Yan was defending the belt. And Sterling happened to... Or may, I think they fought for a vacant one. Either way, the belt was on the line. And Sterling ended up, you know... Peter Yan was doing very good with the striking. That's another guy that we could talk a lot about, but, you know, just to keep it on Aljamain Sterling. Uh, he was going, you know, they were, it was a decent back and forth. Peter Yan was getting the better of him at the striking. Aljamain Sterling is a collegiate wrestler with decent striking in his own right. So he was able to keep up and he was going for a takedown. I believe it was like a single leg. And then, um, and like, he wouldn't get off his knees. He wouldn't, he was trying to really bring him, drag him to the ground. So Peter Yan does an illegal move. Now, this illegal move is if your opponent has both his legs on the ground, you you can't like you can't knee him. You can't knee a downed opponent, pretty much, is kind of what the thing is. Like an opponent like that, you can't straight up knee. So what he did, he's he kind of took his head and like boom, like like that, and hit Sterling like that. I'm not gonna lie, it was a nasty knee, but it's an illegal knee. So um yeah, that was a, that's what got Peter Yan disqualified by hitting Sterling with that illegal knee. And that's how Aljamain Sterling became the Bantamweight champion. Now at this point, um Aljamain Sterling has defended the title twice. You know, in combat sports, they say if if you get a championship, you're not a champion until you defend it. So if you get a belt, you got to defend it to be respected as a real champion and to be put somewhere in the history books. You got to defend it. Um, so he's defended it twice. He he rematched Peter Yan, you know, the you know, the guy that people thought like, oh, like, yeah, Peter Yan, you know, he he lost unfairly. You know, he deserves a rematch. Sterling gave him the rematch and and not and it went all five and. Sterling won. You know, he he's kind of an awkward fighter. You know, he, he kind of used that to his advantage, the same kind of moves, the same kind of takedown, um, to where Peter Yan couldn't knee him illegally. So boom. Like either way, Sterling, you know, was able to get through that tough challenge, was able to get the rematch and beat it, and face TJ Dillashaw. TJ Dillashaw is like an injured kind of dude, so you know, and and he's a guy that retired. He's he's kind of a scumbag. He's he's not really worth. He's a guy that got caught straight up cheating. So like, we don't like yeah. that. So yeah. once you so you mentioned the strengths and weaknesses of these two fighters. Now when they clash, who has the upper hand? Okay, so when these guys fight, you're gonna have Henry Cejudo. He's a guy that's shorter. I believe he's like five six, five seven. He's a shorter guy. He's about the same height as Peter Yan. Maybe a little taller, maybe a little shorter. And they're both pretty short, like five, 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 six. Like Tory Lane's height. But like uh so we got Henry Cejudo, he's a short guy. Aljamain Sterling is is a little bit taller. I believe he's five ten. I believe he's five ten. But either way, um we got a guy that's uh pretty much and Henry Cejudo, a collegiate, uh, not just a collegiate wrestler, one of the best wrestlers that the UFC has ever seen. Um, a guy that's developed striking ability, you know, was able to knock out his last opponent before retiring in Dominic Cruz, and a guy that's been very skilled in striking himself. He's able to keep up with some of the best strikers ever. Um, when he fought Marlon Marias, he proved that he can think on the fly and make those adjustments. Uh, and come out with that knockout. When he fought Demetrius Johnson in the rematch, he proved that he can learn from his mistakes and come back better. He proved that. And this is this is someone that's been training with some of the best guys in the world. Henry Cejudo, if he had never retired, he would probably more than likely still have the belt with the skills that he has. He would have ran into some good fighters, like um Sean O'Malley, Corey Sanhagen, even Peter Yan. Piotr Yan would have been a, a great fight for Henry Cejudo. An amazing fight. But either way, um, uh, 
on any given day, Henry Cejudo could win. Could be anybody in his weight class, in any of those weight classes. So for all the weight. betting men here and women, you would say put your money on Cejudo for this one to be the new champion? No. Mm-hmm. no now okay. I'm going to get to that. Now I'm going to get to that. Because Aljamain Sterling, this is a guy that has longer range. He doesn't maybe use that range too well. Because, you know, um, okay. he's a wrestling guy. He's really just trying to get you down. And he can keep up with you with the striking and do kind of awkward strikes and get out the way, create angles, slip, and, you know, duck and dodge. It's not bad. Um, normally, but but he's not on Henry Cejudo's level in a normal, in a normal sense, you know. Um, this is not someone that's considered a pound for pound guy, you know, as Henry Cejudo, he's one of four, Henry Cejudo is one of four champions fighters ever in UFC to have two belts in two divisions. So this is a legendary guy he's fighting, but we're talking about Henry Cejudo, who's off a three year retirement. Um, got a little bit fat on their retirement, you know, Mm. uh, this is a guy that, uh, yeah, he's been training and he has a great mind, but, you know, he's been focused on a lot of other fighters. You know, he's been having a lot of things going on outside of the cage. Um, whereas Aljamain Sterling has been on an eight fight win streak. And has been and he's in his prime. He's been keeping on going. He's a guy that you really can't take for granted. He's a guy you can't take for granted. Normally, if Henry Cejudo wasn't coming off for retirement, if he wasn't a little bit older, you know, he's also a little shorter, you know, and he's facing another wrestler. So the wrestling is going to almost cancel out each other, if you want to say it like that. But Aljamain also has, you know, good Bra- Brazilian jiu-jitsu ability. Um, and it's a guy that just beat Piotr Jan, one of the, one of the boogeymen of the, of the division. Um, I think Henry Cejudo, it's mostly not just the retirement, his his layoff, but it's uh, it's his mindset. I think he's underestimating Aljamain. Um, the same way people underestimated Aljamain when he fought Piotr Jan. Um, they thought Dillashaw was going to beat Sterling. Um, but, you know, Aljamain Sterling ended up beating TJ Dillashaw very easily. Um, so this guy Sterling knows really how to prove people wrong. Yeah, he has a track record for it. And um, he's a guy that's really good. He's a guy that's really good. Um, I see him I see him winning just uh, just based off of Henry Cejudo kind of, you know, underestimating him and thinking that things are sweet after three years. Like, the division grew since he left, you know. And I think he's going to find out the hard way. But I think it goes five rounds. I think it goes five rounds. Um, All right. We like that switch up. We like that passion. Let's let's see what happens there. And uh, I'm going to give the beginner's luck. Let's give it to um, the reigning champ to retain. And uh, beat that ass in five rounds, like you said. That's and a fact. if he's a re- and um, maybe he can even make this guy tap out, and it'd be a lot of fun to see what happens. It really would. So this next match right here, it is, it um, the next match, the welterweight match, Bilal Muhammad versus Gilbert Burns. Who's That's going to embarrass who? Oh man, so. This is another fight um, with, I guess you would say, a caveat. Uh, like I said, this is a fight that both fighters took on short notice um, to make up for us not getting Oliveira and Darius. Yeah. So it's not like um, like they're both at a disadvantage in that sense, that they both just kind of took the fight on a quick short notice like that. So... Uh, you know, kudos to guys that do that. You know, um, not Somebody saying you have stepping to, you, up. Yeah, you you don't have to lick Dana White's balls. You don't have to do that. But you know, being a real fighter, you know, is caring about the fans. You know, being a real professional is caring about the fans. So kudos to these guys for taking this fight when they could have just waited. They're both very dangerous guys, very dangerous guys. I believe Bilal Muhammad is ranked number four at welterweight. And Gilbert Burns is ranked number five. So okay. Yeah. So this is these are dangerous guys. These are dangerous guys. Um, let's start with Gilbert Burns. Um, Gilbert Burns is a guy that's been, you know, fought some of the best people 
he's really fought some of the best people like, you know, Masvidal, Jorge Masvidal, just put him in retirement. Um, has went, has, you know, has went um, all those rounds with Usman. Uh, you know, he went five rounds with Kamzat Shamayev, the boogeyman. And when I say boogeyman, that's a term in combat sports where it's like, he's a guy that's like avoided. He's a guy that's very dangerous that could really eat your food at any moment and then take your shine. So we call mm -hmm. him the boogeyman. Um, Kamzat Shamayev um, went all five rounds with him in a great fight, an amazing fight. Uh, Dan Hooker, another dude, uh, he's, I think he's Australian. Um, really good kickboxer. Uh, Tyron Woodley, the former champ that everyone knows from getting knocked out from Jake Paul, unfortunately. But um, when they fought, Tyron Woodley was still pretty damn good either way. He had respect at that point. Uh, that's a fact. That's a fact, yeah. Uh, Gilbert Burns, uh, he's a really good Brazilian fighter. He's not like the typical Brazilian fighters where, like, um, He's more of a he's more of a Vitor Belfort where he's where he's focused on his he focuses on explosiveness, but he's way smarter than v, Vitor Belfort. Um, he's almost like a hybrid of like Anderson Silva, Vitor, and maybe even a little bit of um Aldo, you know, uh, with like a little bit of Yoel Romero. He's he's a really good fighter, man. Like, uh, he he knows how to mix things well. He's he's very good at striking, very good at countering, not in the awkward way like Aljamain Sterling, like in a really precise and like calculated way. Very explosive, very good with the wrestling, very good at jujitsu. Uh, but this guy just recently fought less than a month ago. So, you know, when you go from one training camp to another training camp in that short of a time, it's going to affect your performance. It doesn't matter who you are. It's going to affect your performance. Um, it happens all the time um, when people take these short notice fights. It happened with Michael Bisbing when he fought. Uh, what's that guy's name? Well, after he lost the GSP, he fought Kevin Lee. No, not Kevin Lee. Um, Kevin Ferguson, I think. But um, either way, people will know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's guys that, you know, they take these fights on short notice and that just recently fought, you know, they're trying to cram all these fights into a year in a short time. They're trying to get as much money as they can, maximize their income, maximize their check. And it makes sense. And that's when you think of it like that, but it's not very smart to go through a tough training camp and then to fight another dude in such a quick time and such short notice as well. So, mm -hmm. You know, this is this is a really good guy though. This is a guy that's fought the best, best of the best. He's fought the best of the best. Really, and, um, and gun to your head, who do you think is gonna take this? Uh, you know, once again I gotta disappoint you. Cause uh after saying all those good things about him, uh <laughs> he's uh he's I don't see him getting past Bilal Muhammad. Bilal Muhammad is a guy from Chicago, uh I, I'm not sure. I know he's. I know he's. He he's a descendant of like some Middle Eastern. He might be. He might be like a descendant of Kazakhstan or Pakistan or something like that. He always has his flag, in the in the ring when he fights. I'm just not very knowledgeable on fights. You know, excuse me, Bilal Muhammad. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, but Bilal Muhammad is a solid fighter, man. Bilal Muhammad is a side, Is is a very good fighter. This is a guy that just beat a ranked guy named Sean Brady. Um, he's ranked like number nine, but this is a guy that, you know, that was supposed to beat, uh, that was supposed to beat Bilal Muhammad and Bilal Muhammad is able to come up and, you know, come up and actually get a, get a knockout, which he doesn't usually get, which he doesn't usually get. Um, he also doesn't usually get losses either. He hasn't lost really since 2016. Um, when no he way, fought a guy really? named Vicente, yeah, since he, it was a, it was a guy named Vicente Luque, same guy that put Tyrone Woodley into his retirement. Um, now with Bilal Muhammad, he like like I kind of mentioned before, he, he kind of has like I call like caveman striking, where um, 
where he's just kind of like waiting for his opportunity and just and just like comes forward with barrages of punches. Um, I'd say he's a little bit less watch calculated out. at it. Definitely got to watch out. Definitely got to watch out. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say he's as calculated as, but he's he's not really a bad striker. You know, he's you know he's able to get in and out. Uh, he's very strong at wrestling. He he's a guy that's like you know, he's a unanimous decision kind of guy. He's a guy that's usually taking fights to decision. He's not really you know. He's not really gonna knock you out usually. Um, he has some submissions, but this is a guy that has a lot of pressure. He's a volume fighter. He's a volume puncher. Um, now when we say volume puncher, that means like he's throwing he's throwing a lot of punches. You know, um, they might not be the the fastest or the most powerful, but he's throwing a lot of them, and he's coming forward with a lot of pressure. Uh, he has a great chin. And this is a guy that hasn't lost in a while. Like I said, you know, um, he's ranked a little bit above Gilbert Burns. I would watch out. I would watch out, you know. Um, I think in this fight, you got to take Bilal Muhammad. This is a guy that's that's proven, has a lot of pressure. And, you know, when you put pressure on some cracked glass, it's going to break. So... Right now, Gilbert Burns is kind of like some cracked glass right now where, you know, he he just came off of a fight. Yeah, this is a go I'll Super a, Saiyan. Yeah, I'll be it an easy victory, but yeah, you know, yeah, like Bilal Muhammad, is, you, can't, you can't underestimate him, man. You can't underestimate him. So I got Bilal Muhammad winning. All right, I'll pick Burns to be the opposite just because, so it would be a good fight with that. It'll and... be worth it. I mean, that would be amazing. Just want to put it in there. If Burns actually did make this quick of a turnaround and ended up beating Bilal Muhammad, another ranked guy. And was simply Burns outside is... after that. Burns, yeah, Burns, he's saying already that um, if he wins this fight, Dana White has told him that he's the backup for Leon Edwards versus Colby Covington, which is Leon Edwards is a champion of that weight division. He's ranked number one. No, so he's got Colby a lot Covington's... of proof. Yeah, Kobe Covington's ranked the number one, and then the champion is Leon Edwards. So he's above number one. So boom. Like uh so yeah, if, if Burns wins, he could potentially he could potentially be a fill in if something happens between Kobe Covington and Leon Edwards. And and then Bilal Muhammad, he's saying, Oh, yo, like if I win, I better get a title shot. I'm not a substitute. Like he just said it at the press conference today. He was like, Yeah, like I better get a title shot. I'm not no substitute. You like, really you know, earn you really earn your title shots, and in WWE, all they do is say, "Yo, I'm gonna fight you for the championship." That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Word, and a like, little different yeah. in the UFC. Yeah, like, and I guess it's probably PPV numbers too. Where you know McGregor, you know, talking about re- re- wrestling, Conor McGregor really is like a a wrestling character brought into the MMA world. <laughs> He's just like like he he the banter like the he's legit always talking promo about work. Money. Yo, the legit promo work. He is really a wrestler. Like it's it's amazing, you know. Like um, it's funny. Yeah, much respect to them guys. That too, would man. be someday if they if WWE and him ever came together, even for a one off. But we'll see if that happens. And the last match we'll discuss for this main card, the women's strawweight battle, Jessica Andrade Andrade. Andraj, Andraj, Jessica Andraj versus Jan Zianan. Yep. Uh, Jan Zian, Zianan, Zianan. Yeah. Jan Zianan. So. All right, let's try it again. Jessica Andraj versus Jan Zianan. Woman straw weight. All right. I don't know these two women, but I'm sure they're they're cool as fuck. I saw them. They're badass. They look badass. Don't want to mess with them. Who's going to win this battle between these two badass women? Yan Shanan. My bad. I had to hear it one more time. Yan Shanan. Sorry All about right. that. I'm going to pick um... her right away because uh, she she wins the name theory on this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, shoot. That was a battle in itself to really figure that out for Americans like us and stuff. Oh, boy. Like, well, I mean, well, here's the thing. Two things right off bat. It's a beautiful thing that we got, you know, a fighter coming out of China. And we got another fighter coming out of Brazil. And they're both women. 
and they're both badass and they're both ranked. You know, they're both Yan Janan, maybe not as proven, but just came off a really good win off of Mackenzie Dern. Uh whereas Jessica Andrade is like I think she's ranked like number eight or nine in the pound for pound rankings for women. Like um it's really cool to see, you know, two two fighters that speak different languages that are women that are coming together in a co main event. You know, part of the headline. It's it's amazing. You know, it's this this sport has come a long way. Um, we're not talking about Ronda Rousey anymore. We're talking about new fighters. Mm -hmm. And it's cool. You know, Dana White at one point was saying that he would never, never allow women to fight in the UFC. And now, you know, we got these typical co-main events with women now. It's it's now it's a typical thing. It's cool. It's Love amazing. To see it. That's a fact. Now to get into them, um, with Yan Xiaonan, uh, let's start with her. Um and uh this is the it's a good flow switch up too since I kind of caught you off guard with the other two. So I won't catch you off guard as much with this one. But Yan Jianan, Chinese fighter, they're fighting at 115. That is women's strawweight division. And she's she's a pretty good fighter. She she's been training with some with some guys with some guys named Team Alpha. Team Alpha Male. It's a it's a gym. I believe it's out in California. It's owned by a guy named Uriah Faber, who's an MMA legend in his own right. Um, there's guys like uh, Corey Garbrandt there, uh, Gunnar Nelson, a few other fighters. They got a lot of fighters there. Um, but guys that you could really learn from. You know, guys that have been around the sport forever. Um, she just recently got up with them to get better with her takedown defense and stuff. Um. These are the kind of things that people don't look into. You know, when you're looking into a fight, I got to tell you real quick. When you're looking into a fight, bro, there's a lot of things you got to look into. You got to look into recent, you know, recent history, you know, uh, stylistic matchups. You got to look at, you know, um, overall circumstances. Like, is it a short notice fight or where are they fighting? Are they fighting in Mexico where the elevation is higher? I uh, see, I see. And, and you got to think about who the coaches are, what kind of coaches, you know, what kind of what kind of training they got going on. Are they working with like, you know, experts in wrestling, experts in striking? You know, it's things like that. You know, people don't take it to take into account when they're thinking about these bets and, you know, thinking about their predictions and thinking about fights. You know, a trainer could change how a fighter completely operates, you know, and uh and I think we're kind of seeing that with Jeanan, where she's getting this takedown defense. You know, she's able to defend 70% 70, 70 of her takedowns, you know, that are attempted on her, which is a pretty damn good number for someone that's usually a striker. And, you know, as far as, like, Chinese fighters are still pretty new to the game. As far as at the elite level that we're seeing them at, you know, Zhang Weili is the champion of this division, of the strawweight division. So that's another fighter from China that's absolutely killing it. Um Xiaonan is a striker, kind of like Zhang Weili, but more patient. She's she's a very good striker, you know, very well composed and you know knows how to move around the octagon, has a pretty good jab, you know. But she's patient. She's not someone that's gonna go out there and try to get the kill like Andrage's. Um or Chris Cyborg, or even Shevchenko, which um even Shevchenko is is a problem. Even though she's a weight class, I believe she's weight class under. But either way, um, yeah, we we got someone that's you know really good at judo as well. You know, someone that is able to use her judo and fights to turn the tide, and someone that's pretty well rounded, and is coming up the rankings and just came off a good win. So that leads us to Jessica Andrade. I believe it's Andrade, Andrade or Andrade. Either way, um, this is a this is a girl that has a record of twenty four and ten. She has about thirty four MMA it. fights. Oh yeah, oh yeah. When you hear see when you hear a record like that in boxing, it's not that impressive. But when you hear a record like that in MMA, it is impressive. 
because it shows you've been fighting for a long time. Because, mm -hmm. you know, MMA fights, you know, like they take a lot out of you, you know. So to have more than like even 20 fights is like, OK, you've been around for a while. Now, and you're getting up to like over 30 fights and yeah, you've been around, you've been around. So she's a, she's one of the goats. Now, if I remember correctly, just to make sure I'm not giving you no BS. She is the first woman fighter to gain a knockout in three weight divisions. All right. First so she's got the hands. That. Yeah, she has a history of having the hands. And okay. she's been giving these hands out in different divisions uh, for a little while. Has fought some of the best fighters out there. Like, she's literally fought some of the best fighters out there. Um, She she fought a, a girl named Rose Damahunas, who's another really good fighter. Um, Just to give you a testament to her ability in jujitsu alone. Um... She was able to reverse a Kimura attempt. A Kimura is kind of like a, it's a type of choke. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not much of a jujitsu practitioner. I only know a few chokes. But the Kimura choke is a really nasty choke. Um, it starts with grabbing the wrist. I know that's where the beginning point kind of goes. But um, but um, Jessica Andraj is has able has been able to reverse a Kimura, and been able to slam a girl on her damn head. Ooh, and knock wow. her out. Yeah, this is a girl that's raw, like super raw, and been around the block. And just, to, just a you know, just coming from that Brazilian cloth is you know says a lot about you as well. Now, when it comes to these two, it's it's another caveat. I I would say it's another caveat, um, because the fight is being fought at straw weight. Now this Yan Xiaonan, this is her natural weight class. Um, Jessica Andrade has been jumping through weight classes for a little while. She didn't have much success at flyweight, so she's coming back to straw weight. And even though she's been around the block, she's in the pound for pound rankings for women right now, and is very technical, aggressive fighter. I believe she might be the favorite as far as betting odds go. Um, but uh. The problem with that is when you fluctuate in weight, it can really mess with your body. It happened to Roy Jones Jr. You know when he when he went all the way up to heavyweight from like super middleweight and stuff. And, you know it happens to other fighters. You know, like even Chad Dawson when he fought Andre Ward, and we're talking about boxing, but either way, just examples of how fluctuating between weight can really mess your career up. Um. She just came off a bad loss, whereas Yan Xiaonan just came off a good win. Um, this is her natural weight class, whereas Andraj is coming back to the weight class. Uh, I feel like Andraj is becoming war torn. You know, I feel like she's been you know through through some battles, and I think she's trying to find her place back at you know straw weight because she's had success against Rose Namajunas, who's like who's ranked above above both of them right now. So this is really a, a big fight for her career to prove something. I would say so for both, for both, you know, because Yan Jonan wins this and she just beat, you know, a, a pound for pound women's fighter. You mm -hmm. know, that's a hell of a name to put on your resume after Mackenzie Dern, someone that's been another Irish girl that's been promoted pretty heavily. Um, and Jessica Andrade, she's she's trying to, you know, she's trying to, you know, reclaim glory and. And, you know, it gets tough. Those, you know, those roads back to glory get tough. And I think for Andrade's, I think the weight change is going to be a little too much. She's shorter than Jeanan. Um, I would say a little bit more sloppier with her with her um striking, too. Whereas Jeanan is more patient. All right. And, some uh, pretty textbook stuff, though. And uh, I'm going to go with Jan for this one. I believe in her. I believe in her. Me, too. She's probably going to take it um all five rounds. I see all three of these fights going five rounds, to be honest. I don't really see any knockouts happening. If oh, there were right. to be a knockout to happen, it would it would probably be either Andrade knocking out Jan or Cejudo getting a knockout on Sterling. I don't, I don't see 
or Bilal could, you know, you know, Gilbert Burns could really supremely crumble under that pressure. And, you know, and Bilal could put him out just like he put out Sean Brady in his last outing. But for the most part, I, if you're a betting man, don't bet on don't bet on knockouts for none of these main events. Just bet on the, the wins. And I would say we got Sterling going to defend. He's going to defend his title. I would say Bilal Muhammad is going to be a pretty tired uh, Gilbert Burns. And I believe Jan Janan is going to prove that she belongs in that weight class. And she's going to be the Andrade who's been, you know, trying to find her place back in the game. All right. So this is going to be a pretty stacked card, Dolo. I think we're going to, this is a good place to start for us. Um, Hit the John Jones stuff, hit the card. Is there anything else you want to mention regarding UFC or MMA at the moment? I do want to talk about this. Um, That's good. Luke, Luke Rockhold versus Mike Perry. Um, They fought in Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. Mike Perry and Luke Rockhold are both ex-UFC fighters. Luke Rockhold had the Bare belt Knuckle Fighting Championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I kind of glossed over that. I kind of, kind of went by that really quickly. Uh, but um, I'm going to get back to that very shortly. Um, Luke Rockhold had a belt in UFC. Um, I believe he fought like heavyweight or middleweight. No, I think it was middleweight. I think it was middleweight. Um, either way, he had a belt in the UFC. Um, didn't really, you know, I kind of told you before, you got to kind of defend that belt for people to really call you that. Um, he didn't really defend it. He he lost it against Michael Bisbee. And then, um, and then pretty much, yeah, like, but he still had a belt, so you still got to call him a champion. Um, and Mike Perry is just a guy that he's, he's a, some will call, will call, call him the typical Floridian. Mm-hmm. Or he's kind of just nuts, or he kind of just is crazy. He has that label where he's just like nuts. He's out of his mind. Um, uh, <laughs> he, you know, he 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 takes liberties and talking a certain way. Uh, I don't want to, you know, don't want to have have you censor anything, so I, I won't say exactly how he talks. But you know, um, he talks very. He's, he talk, he's a straight. trash talker. Yeah, he's. He's he's a trash talker. He talks street, um, and like uh, some people call him like the. It's funny because like some people just call him a hood fighter. Like he's just a hood fighter. And there's a joke that kind of goes around with Mike Perry. And mind you, I'm saying you know I'm starting off with the jokes because Mike Perry is really he's a he's a really ferocious striker. He's a really ferocious striker, um. I wouldn't say the most calculated, but he's really not bad. You know, he's helped Jake Paul in training. He's he's been Jake Paul's spar- sparring partner. You know, after the UFC, um, he's had some good scraps. He's a guy that literally I could show I could show you better than I could tell you. Mike Perry is a type of person that fights like a pit bull, and literally, no matter what injury he has he's going to keep on going and he's going to want to fight he's just someone that is just a gladiator at heart um although he's kind of a you know he's, he's kind of seen as an idiot how he talks but this guy has heart look at his fit look at his face do you see that picture i can see explain to the viewers who are listening to this though i see it from here and anyone watching youtube but looks like he just got his face bashed in and he's still going it's... right yeah man it is yeah, that that nose is kind of hard to see with the brightness, but his nose is bent all the way to the left of his face, or or in this picture it would be to the right. His nose bridge is literally is like um is like a greater than sign. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a guy that has literally like fought through broken noses, doesn't stop going, and and couldn't find success in UFC per se, but was able to go into bare knuckle fighting championships right after UFC um, where he's actually found success. He's actually the champion at his weight class in bare knuckle fighting. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's been, it's oh, been a kind of crazy turnaround, but it's a turnaround nonetheless. Like I've always been the kind of person where I've looked at bare knuckle fighting 
I'm gonna get back to the fight real quick, but I want to say this real quick. I've always looked at bare knuckle fighting as like kind of a hillbilly sport. <laughs> they would talk about it in the past before too. Bare knuckle fighting, excuse me. They would have tournament bare knuckle fighting tournaments in Ireland where these guys would, you know, get drunk and really just fight for like wooden belts, like weird stuff like that. Like, you know, when they talk about the fighting Irish, that's what it comes from. These dudes used to literally just fight bare knuckle for fun. They're friends. They, that's how they got down. Um, like uh, with bare knuckle fighting, I've, I guess recently with this last showing when Luke Pitt, when Luke Rockhold and Mike Perry fought, a lot of stars came out. You had Kamaru Usman, the the former welterweight champion, come out. You had Conor McGregor come out. Um. Then you had another two fighters that were on the undercard with a co-main event, Chad Mendez and Eddie Alvarez, two monsters in their own right. Two guys that both got knocked out by Conor McGregor, I might add. But um, but two guys in their own right that are amazing fighters, that used to be amazing fighters in UFC. Um, they went at it too. There was more people, you know. I, I, I'm trying to think. It was, it was a star-studded crowd. Just the fact that they had Conor McGregor there is big on its own. Um, and maybe maybe the star power has kind of, like, persuaded me to accept it a little more mm -hmm. and, like, the success of it all. But honestly, man, when it comes to bare-knuckle fighting, that's – you you find – you can find things in, like, hieroglyphics and, like, you know, old Egyptian stuff and old documents from the past – from all types of eras where boxing was a competition that people did. Right. Back then it was like, I believe it was bare knuckle. I think there, there were some eras where like some places in the world where they did have some type of padding on their hands and they would just like fight for fun or like as competition. Yeah. Obviously you got the gladiators and stuff like that. And Japan, the samurais and we'll do the wild west where they had the gun duels and stuff, but boxing, Man-to-man, hand-to-hand -hand combat is the purest form of competition. It's one of the, it's one of the reasons that MMA fans be, are MMA fans. We believe that this is the purest form of competition. One man against one man. Will versus will. Knowledge versus knowledge. So who wins? Who falls? Who stands up? You know, um, And bare-knuckle boxing is that. It really is the bare bones of what we see MMA as today, of what we see boxing particularly as today. It all started with your hands. That's all you had at one point. And, still uh, brutal. I just want to say still if, brutal. Yeah, I wonder if maybe it will, if it'll catch on. And uh, be what do you think? Do you watch. think that's something that will catch on? What do you think? I think it'll be a some twi It'll be some TikTok. It'll be like TikTok famous. And like trends like that way like showing little videos i don't know if we'll see yo the, but to continue Pim about it I'm, I'm my bad to interrupt you matt it's funny that you say it like that because luke rockhold when mike perry and luke rockhold fought fought the the two big stories were one um mike perry knocks luke rockhold's veneers out of his like his like his top three teeth right here like completely shattered this way like ha you know, just bone meeting bone. And that was pretty crazy. You know, that must have been expensive to get them veneers fixed. Luke Rockhold actually got them fixed like the next week after. Um oh, and man. the second be strong, was, boy. Yo, gotta boy. be strong. Yeah, take them painkillers, man. You you know, you gotta do something. I hopefully, you know, you put that on your credit card or something, cause hey, I mean, shoot, honestly. His his the money he probably earned from the fight went to his teeth, which is pretty bad. Oh, but he, but like you know, Conor McGregor getting in there, you know, showing love to to Mike Perry was pretty cool. Mike Perry was you know someone that was at a very low point in his life, you know, getting into bar fights, you know, like losing fights in the UFC he was on like a five six fight losing streak before he got xed out the company, and he becomes the champion in bare knuckle fighting, and then get some promo with conor mcgregor like that's pretty cool man like you know shout to mike perry man you know just to, just to show you man you don't have to be the smartest guy in the, in the world you don't gotta even be the smartest guy in the room but you can make some money and you can find success in this world and mike perry is a great testament to that and that was one of the big reasons i wanted to talk about the bare knuckle thing 
Well, we'll, it, we'll be on the lookout time. for it. We'll, we'll be on the lookout for it. And there's some great comeback stories there. But Dolo, we've been killing it. UFC 288 is going to be a special one. And let us hope these predictions pan out. And let us see where this all unfolds. But we appreciate this, Dolo. And um, we'll catch you for the next one. And, and uh, thanks for coming on. That's a fact, man. I'm I'm glad you're introducing, you know, MMA and combat sports to the to the platform. And I'm and I'm honored to be the one to chauffeur it in. And yeah, man, thank you for thank you for the time, man. You know, you know how we do. We're gonna keep killing it. Shout out to the basketball crew. Shout out to the NFL crew. Shout out to the college ball crew. <laughs> and shout out to the past, present, and future guests of this platform. Toast mm-hmm. to success, man. I appreciate you, man. Now we're adding MMA to it. All right, Dolo, we appreciate you, and we'll see you soon. That's the great Dolo Ren, everybody. Don't forget to check out UFC 288 on pay-per-view on Saturday night. Coming from Newark, New Jersey. I'll catch you, Matt. All right, catch you later, Dolo.